Anton Krieger here. This episode of All Things Green is brought to you by NextGen Clean Energy Solutions, your sustainability easy button from concept to completion. Welcome to All Things Green. I'm Anton, and today I'm joined by a very special guest. Aiden Meany is a champion of sustainable fashion through his business, Found Surface, and work with the Ohio's Fibershed Initiative. Aiden, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. I'm stoked. You're a young guy, you're from the Cleveland area, and you started some of your fashion and sewing and all that kind of stuff right here in Ignatius, Ohio, not not just a few blocks from here. I did, yeah. So I grew up in Lakewood, um, and I went to St. Ignatius, which is just down the street. Uh, sewing was an early thing in my life, so I got taught by my grandmother, um, primarily for chores. It was like not a fun thing as when it was first introduced to me. So grandma um, made you do chores, yes, like grandma, uh, yeah. sewing clothes. So she was really mad that there was no more home ec taught in school so oh, wow. she, I, I called we all called her nan growing up right so it was nanek it was like <laughs> over the weekends we'd go over there and it'd be wood shop with nan and yeah wow. it was wild so very hands-on yeah. and you said on sewing age. not wood shop i did yeah i did it took me a while like 14 15 i started getting into it i realized it as an art form i started doing fine art uh for several years just doing classes as a kid and then realized oh i can draw have fun with that and then go see that further and make something out of it through clothing. And that was just the first medium I really like ran with. Yeah. That's excellent. And St. Ignatius had um, some growth during your time there because of you as an exceptional student, they opened up some programs and things like that. Do you mind telling me a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So I, when I first arrived on campus, um, they, they had a fantastic art department. They had nothing in, in, garment design, fashion design, um, like most high schools, like that's sure. not a <laughs> common thing. Yeah. Uh, so I went up there and said, Hey, I want to participate in the, uh, art shows that are going on, but I want to make clothes. I want to do what I'm, you know, really feeling right now. Um, and they let me do a show every year. Um, so I, would do my schoolwork and then I'd finish that as quick as I could. And I'd <laughs> go upstairs. And so I had like a little sewing room at my parents' house and I would, it was like, Actually, a great way to get through high school having something like that because it gave me a reason to finish the you yeah know, the the boring work of something time. to look forward to. Right, right. <laughs> Do you have like a favorite garment that you um, had sewn for an art show there? Oh yeah. Well, I was doing. It, it got to a point where in my junior year, I was doing fifty piece collections and doing footwear and tons oh of stuff. At, like at like sixteen, which was pretty like a lot of work. Um, so I made a lot of in terms of volume. I made a lot of stuff actually by hand then. Um, so there's too many to. I love them all, but definitely love the first piece I ever made with my grandmother. When I went to her and said, hey, I actually want to make clothes, she was shocked, right? Because it was a chore. It wasn't fun. I'd show up when I had to and leave when I could. And then and then I called her one day and said, I want to make clothes. And she was like blown away. So wow. yeah, yeah. So that piece is probably, you know, in the Hall of Fame for sure. It's not an overstatement to say that you're a protege. Uh, you started up a few companies since since being in high school. Uh, tell me a little bit about Found Surface. Yeah, so Found Surface is a company I started during uh, during the pandemic, actually, in 2020. Uh, started while I was in college at Syracuse University, uh, sitting back, you know, online student, realizing how little we make here, seeing all of the the news and headlines and stuff on social media about like where's my where's my toilet paper you know where's yeah. where's where are all these like core needs right yeah and uh that just put the, the that was the light bulb moment realizing hey we don't do anything here um mm. we don't make anything here we do a lot here sorry. Mm -hmm. um but there's there's a real need to uh invest in manufacturing we offshored a lot of it and pandemic was a real catalyst moment in realizing maybe we should have a little bit here Tell me, tell me a little bit about the right way to produce clothing versus the wrong way, so to speak, or the most sustainable option for clothing yourself. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I have, I feel like I have pretty high standards because it's my everyday. That's cool. um, I, I want to hear your high standards. <laughs> I want to, I want to um, get on Aiden Meany's standards. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, everything we, the 
Cl- clothing is something we touch every day, right? This is on our bodies every day. Sure. And if we looked at it the same way we look at, um, or the same way we should be looking at food, mm-hmm. um, I think we would be a lot more skeptical uh, mm-hmm. of what is av- like at our the tips of our fingers right now. So 99% of the clothing that we're wearing here in the U.S. is coming from uh, coming from China, but also uh, you know Vietnam and Singapore and places where um, production processes just are really swept under the rug. And even those in, in fashion jobs and positions and roles in America, most of them don't see production. Like I, this is something I, I experienced, um, with our own team as we started really expanding and hiring pattern makers, hiring sewers, designers. Um, we realized none of them, even with master's degrees have seen production, Mm-hmm. Right. And so mm-hmm. if they're not seeing it and they're underinformed, then those wearing it are going to have no clue. Right. Like the, the dissonance between product and customers is so wide in particularly in clothes. Right. So right. Um, the first you know, step that I always tell everybody when I'm talking about how we should you know, change the narrative, change our processes, we just got to understand what it takes to make clothes. Yeah. Um, because. You can tell someone to shop sustainably and then they look at the price tag and they're like, all right, cool. Not for me. Right. Yeah, and and sure. that's, that's a big thing we run into. Um, so understanding the real process is the first step, I think, before you can start setting, setting goals for your, your, your own personal habits. Right. Like you need to know what, what it takes to make a shirt, you know, something yeah. simple. Right. So, so yeah. something as simple as like choosing materials like wool and maybe cotton over uh, plastic, plastic fibers or something like that. Is totally. that, is that something that your company focuses on? Absolutely. So we, we don't use plastic at all. Um, we will never do that. Um, <laughs> what are, what are some examples? What are those plastic fibers called? If you look at the little tag on the back of your mm-hmm. shirt, what are, so what are those called? Nylon, polyester are the big ones, the big, the, the usual suspects. Um, <laughs> I think really when you're looking at performance and athletic wear, mm-hmm. it's, it's most, it's most of that. Um, but even stuff that can be a hundred percent cotton is generally blended. Right. So mm. if you look at your, your tag and it has, and you don't know, it's like food, right? Like if you look at the tag on your clothing and you have no idea what it is, it shouldn't be on your skin 24 hours a day. Like, yeah, that's crazy. It's just like with what you're eating. If you read the label and you don't know what any of that stuff is, should you be eating it? Right. So Aiden, I know that you have a cool company in found surface and you still have maintained full ownership of the company. There's no shares out there with other um, owners or investors. And how has that helped you maintain uh, a sustainable principle in your company? Yeah. So we have a really uh, strategic roadmap for the next 10 years. My goal has always been where in 10 years we should be uh, absorbing 1% of all apparel production that is being contracted from the U.S. to overseas, um, which to give you a, like a frame of mind for that, that's it's about $3 billion worth of okay, wow. like work. <laughs> yeah. um, so to get there, I've always seen it as you know crucial that the uh, those who can decide, those sailing the ship, understand mm-hmm. that and understand what needs to happen to get there. Um, I understand my own commitment to reinvesting everything we do in the company towards meeting that goal. And that's always been really important to me. So, um, it's, it's been tricky. It's really hard to, to bring in investment, uh, which we have done without giving up equity. Um, and I think that's a testament to the work we are doing, right. Is that we're, we're able to get people to come in and collaborate and support us that understand the impact that, you know, it found services full glory will be able to provide not only for Cleveland, but for the United States and for everyone who wears clothes, which is a lot of people. Yeah. I think that's really cool that you're not selling out to um, people that want to maybe do other things with your company. You have your principles, you're sticking to it and you're using that as like a vehicle for improving sustainability globally, but also right here in Cleveland. Right. Definitely. It's, it's, it's a tricky thing. You know, most clothing companies don't, own or they're not vertically integrated right they're not doing their own production they're not investing in production so i've always had a a concern where if ownership was shared that that would turn into a problem where it's like we should just be a clothing company yeah and and not worry about all these like this overhead right but 
there's a much larger vision to found surface and, and it involves, you know, more than just being a clothing brand. So in the same way that it impacts the world globally, trying to change the narrative, trying to, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but kind of like reinvent how we look at sustainable clothing, what we're putting on our bodies every day. Tell me a little bit about, um, the fiber shed move movement right here in the Midwest. Yeah. So the fiber shed movement is, uh, something, the main reason why I stayed in Cleveland, honestly, to okay. start the company. Um, I, when I was starting the company, I was like, should I be in New York where, you know, there's a scene like the, you know, the whole fashion, everyone knows, you know, fashion in New York and, or yeah. like even like LA and what, what Cleveland and in particular, the Midwest Rust Belt region has, uh, is, is in my opinion, an absolute gold mine. Um, so a couple interesting stats that come to mind when I say it's a gold mine, uh, we have the most alpaca per square foot than any state in the United States, <laughs> which is absurd more, more than anywhere in this entire country. We have uh, a completely circular, regenerative source of fiber for apparel. How are we not using this, right? Like, this insane. is our main focus. And, and yeah. it's, it goes for sheep as well. So it goes for sheep's wool. Uh, it goes for uh, fla growing flax, uh, which is, you know, a, you can make a ton of different kinds. That's linen, basically. Mm -hmm. So you can make linen out of flax. Um, and then we have a very similar climate to uh, areas in Japan where they grow indigo, right? So okay. we can also have an abundance of a natural dye capability here, right? So there's a lot of uh, – the reason the fiber shed movement is, is, is feasible is because of the natural gold mines that exist here. So it's really just a network of individuals, nonprofits, companies that see the value in that and understand the steps that need to be made to connect each other, to make that a uh, circular economy and something we can really start like scaling and use. So tell me, tell me about how, um, you are the business side of things and you are talking to farmers. You're going, you're going right up to these people who produce raw materials yeah. and you're, you're creating these networks. I mean, what does that look like? You know, talking <laughs> person to person with a farmer, I'm just like imagining you like driving up to somewhere in Medina and like knocking on somebody's door. Tell me, tell me about talking to farmers. Yeah. It's funny. You're spot on with Medina. That's <laughs> actually where like our largest farming partner is, which <laughs> is <funny>. crazy. <laughs> we didn't rehearse that. that was, um, so yeah, it's, you know, Ohio has tons of agricultural, you know, business going on and a lot of something that's very special about that category of business is that they generally stay in the family, right? These are generally uh, farms that are being passed down, that have a lot of history, that they have a lot of uh, uh, passion in the work that they're doing. And, yeah. um, and, and it's all they do all day. It's a really hard job. And in particular, it's something where really large companies are coming in from out of town and, and we're talking about Amazon, right? Like yeah. to, the, to the little guy. And there's a lot of that going on in agriculture, particularly in Ohio too. So we, we want to help them. We don't see uh, when, for example, when we went to go meet with um, our first farming partner in Medina, mm -hmm. um, there, there's a, you got to make a relationship with them. Yeah. There's no, nothing is going to come out of coming down and saying, Hey, we have an idea. Let's do business together. They're fine. They yeah. don't need anyone coming in on yeah. their land and telling them what to do. Right? Mm -hmm. They could do that forever. They've done it for a hundred years. They've passed it down. You know. Yeah. It's uh, it's never easy to be a farmer. So coming down and saying, "Hey, I have an idea," is there's a lot of weight to that. Like, sure. right? So that's why we started our nonprofit uh, at Found Surface uh, called Lattice, um, which was built solely because we understand the sensitivity to that. Um, and understand that going down and communicating can't be about a bottom line. We can't, we can't be worried about how, how much labor costs to send people to talk to farmers that defeats the whole part. We need to just go meet with farmers, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then let that grow into something wonderful and useful. Just as an aside, how did you learn all of this business stuff? Was did they teach you all this at a uh, Saint Ignatius or you know Bay Bay for the Arts or like <laughs> was this all kind of on the fly for you? Very, yeah, <laughs> I, uh, very on the fly. I have made lots of mistakes. I've you know 
been burned. I, there, you know, it's, there's, there's a, the only thing I can point to is that I adapt quickly. And so I mm. feel that my, you know, and I'm, I'm just like, like anyone can do something incredible, right? If they, if they have, you know, timing and understand momentum and understand that, you know, the long game is the way and, and that's how I see everything. And so I try not to get too uh, bogged down in particular details or times where I've come mm. up short. Um, there's, that's, that's the part of being a human being. So of course it's going to happen in business, right? Like there's a funny, you know, a funny uh, tactic that, that I learned in selling mentorship when I was young, like 15, that, mm. uh, you know, if you have to look at the right or the wrong side of the fabric too much to decide which one is the right or the wrong side, yeah. if, you, if it takes more than 30 seconds, then it doesn't matter, right? Like, yeah. just go make it. So <laughs> that is what I try to take into a lot of this work um, is, is understanding that, listen, we might not know, we might, we, we might be like 50% sure about something, but what's the worst that's going to happen versus the benefit of just staying in motion, right? Like yeah. just ver ver versus just learning. Cause if you're in motion, you're learning, right? So that's, that's how I've been looking at stuff. Words to live by. Tell me, tell me more about Lattice. You mentioned Lattice, uh, a nonprofit that, um, brings together communities, uh, brings together farmers, uh, taking kind of like a community-based, vocational-based, and um, education-based work. Can you tell me about the model for that? Yeah, absolutely. So Lattice is a certified nonprofit um, focused on re research and development to revitalize the natural fiber movement that the Rust Belt, you know, region has been creating. Yes, so, yes. Um, so what we've done is is understand, like I said, the the sensitivity and the time needed to in the, in the best way, in the realest way possible, grow this community and grow this economy with everybody that is really crucial to that thriving, right? And so um, that is best done through a nonprofit, hands down. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we go create a very actionable um, to, to, I call it small, but they're really important, but very actionable, completable projects that we can mm -hmm. derive key metrics on its impact from. Beautiful. And we just go strategically complete them as we get funding for it. Um, and that is a, a mega help for every player in this, you know, very important circle to yes. get animal fiber regional production uh, for, for apparel, but for any real soft good. I think that's amazing. And how does digital knitting come into this whole fiber shed movement, the fashion? How, how does digital knitting give the United States a leg up over other manufacturers in the world? Yeah, this is my favorite Your bread and thing to talk about. I'm so glad you brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, was, I was waiting for this. Because um, this is also what I've been like knee deep in for like a while. Mm -hmm. um, and the, you know... This year, we brought all of our sewing to Cleveland. We built a sewing team, cut and sew, right? There's eight people in a given day at our headquarters cutting and sewing clothes, um, just like we used to here in the 20s and 30s. Yeah. And it's, it's, an amazing, it's an amazing trade. It's an amazing way of making clothes. It's, it, it's the only way to really make clothes historically. Um, but things have taken we've advanced and we've invented inc like incredible equipment and technology that allow us to make clothing uh, in a way that kind of meets the needs of the consumer a little bit better now. And so one of these feats of technology are, is digital knitting in the yeah. world of digital knitting machines. Um, those machines uh, I like to think of as being 3D printers of thread. So you can create fully fashion, what's called fully fashioned, which means um, no sewing needed, right? Yeah. So um, you can create fully fashioned garments out of a flatbed digital knitting machine, which is what Found Surface has started. In, we just got our first series of equipment um, like a month ago. So wow. yeah, it's, it's been a crazy time. You've, um, been, you've been playing with your new toy lately. <laughs> we've been, well, it's not in yet. We ordered it. Okay. We, 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 so like we have a really awesome, yeah, I wish I've been dreaming in my, in my <laughs> dreams. I've been, I've been playing with it. Um, but we, we've been hiring the, the team necessary. So it's a, it's a specialized labor. It's, it's a, it's a, 
it's a programming job. So in, in, in order to uh, execute on the like 3D printing type capabilities, you need to, you know, work in a software and program mm -hmm. the, uh, the style or garment that you want. And then you go send that to the machine and it knits it out, right? Yeah. Just, literally just like 3D printing. Yeah. That's a specialized job. We've been hired. We've, we've built our team out. So we have really the most talented programmers in the, in the country. Um, that took some convincing to come join, you know, a little startup in Cleveland and, uh, not a giant company that, you know, uh, is just maybe like toying in the pond of digital knitting for sure. fun, right? We're, this is our, our future for making yes. clothes in the U S. Uh, it is the only way that we will be able to, uh, compete with overseas pricing. So yeah. I can, I'd be happy to get into that if you want. Yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like these machines that, uh, are able to digitally knit, they can maybe run 24, 7, 365. And that's a lot that's going to maybe uh, help you overcome producers like China that are paying people, uh, maybe not the greatest wages, Absolutely. but paying people to do the sewing. Is that? Yeah, totally. So there's, um, we have a path here towards uh, scalable production mm -hmm. that does not break the bank for the consumer and actually imp significantly improves the quality and lifespan of the garment. So what, what we're doing right now is, is it, it is abundantly clear that we can increase the quality of, of raw material. So mm -hmm. use the highest quality cotton or the highest quality wool or alpaca, like the most sustainable, uh, durable threads we can get our hands on here, yeah. here in the U S yeah. and particularly in Ohio. And we can do that and keep the cost at what's familiar because you only need one tech to run about seven or 10 of these machines. And just like you said, these machines can run all day long. Yeah, so yeah. Um, you don't need to be paying a sewer 23 an hour to make your shirt, which t-shirts take hours to make. Like, really? Yeah. Like, like a t-shirt, <laughs> like, like a simple t-shirt yeah. is from start to finish, from cutting to, to you're done sewing this thing is uh, maybe on a good day, like in a day you can do like, I'm embarrassed know, that I didn't know that. That's like, kind of insane. Like <laughs> truly. And, and now there's, there's specialized equipment. You can get to streamline it. There's machines that can do the necklines faster and stuff like that. But these are like, you know, that's mega overhead. That's like really expensive. Um, and so, so to put that in perspective, right. You're, that's seven, eight hours in a day to make your t-shirt that most people are expecting to be what? 10 bucks, 15 bucks. Right. And so we're never going to, you know, unless you're breaking lot, like you're creating crimes against humanity for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. You're never going to get that here in the yeah. US. Like we yeah. can't do it. So these, these, these machines are, uh, now, now you have to pay one person. You gotta pay them more specialized job. You know, they have a master's degree in it. Um, but, you can have 10 of these things cranking away at almost anything you want. And the key is, is zero waste. Yeah. So it's knitting out just what you need. That's There's amazing. no cutting waste. So it eliminates an entire step of normal production. So it makes it faster, but it also deletes the waste generated from that step at the same time. That's super. Yeah. And your company is all about fashion. That's going to look cool in a hundred years. Um, it's not, it doesn't look like a hand me down, but it's something that you'll want to hand down. Right. I mean, this is everyday <laughs> wear, cool stuff, unisex clothing. Um, I know that you plugged your store right, right down the, yeah. uh, the way here, right mm. down the way here. <laughs> right. Literally like a block away. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to stop in, but Aiden, I really admire how you've started a nonprofit. You've started a business. You've taken the principles of sustainability um, and you're using it as a vehicle to improve the community. Um, you're using it as a vehicle to change the conversation about fashion globally and create jobs right here in Cleveland, Ohio. What would you give as a call to action for somebody who is a Gen Z or a millennial that's looking to make their mark in sustainability? Yeah. Um, easy. It's, it's, know your neighbor and participate in the community you're in easy. Um, mm. no, we've, we've been, been a lot of efforts to fragment our idea of community and fragment our idea of living in a, in a neighborhood and, and really only caring about 
uh, your your di- your digital footprint and and what your presence is digitally. And that's yeah. great. There's fun. Like I'm not saying give up Instagram, sure. you know, but I am saying that we should know who is around us. There's a lot of interesting opportunities in the people that are just right around. I mean, like I had no idea you guys were a block away from our store, right? Yeah. And so, <laughs> but the way that we met is you came out to a real life event that I was speaking at. And now we're here doing this, right? So like that didn't happen through like a stranger trying to throw in a, you know, a Hail Mary in the DMs. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't happen without putting the effort in. Right. And and you just don't get to, you know, we've talked about working with farmers and establishing these these crucial relationships and it all comes down to communication and we need to learn how to communicate uh, in in several ways. We should be multifaceted in in our way to communicate with each other for sure. Yeah. I think that's a beautiful thing. Aiden, thank you so much for talking all things green with me today. Is there anybody that you'd like to plug uh, to the audience? Yeah, definitely. So uh, I'd love to shout out our store, the Impossible Art Store, West 29th in Detroit in Cleveland. It's where you can discover really what the creative scene here looks like. Uh, We highlight tons of artists. You can also follow Found Surface on Instagram at Found Surface. Um, and we post all of our information and process on our website as well, just foundsurface.com. If you'd like to stay connected with the show, be sure to follow us on TikTok at ATG Show. And if you'd like to rewatch full episodes, check out our YouTube channel, All Things Green Show. You can find all of our sources from today's episode in our show notes. All Things Green will be back soon. Thank you so much for being a part of the global sustainability movement.